All right, thank you, ushers. Wow, it is so good to be back. Go ahead and start the cameras, start the talk, do all that kind of stuff. Thank you, guys. I just want to say, long time no see. <laughs> it is so much fun for me to be here right now today, particularly since we're doing the baptism. And that was, that was my huge goal, was to be here for this Baptism Sunday. Many thanks to baptism candidates that waited so that I could, you know, I mean, we had to cancel and reschedule a couple of different times kind of as this thing played out. For those of you who are visiting and don't know, I just had at the beginning, basically, of the end of June, beginning of July, I had a kidney stone. I've had them before. They're horrible, but it wasn't that big of a deal. But this turned out to be a quite a bit of a different kind of a deal. They were, they were extremely large, and there was, they were causing kidney problems. So I had to go through a series of surgeries and several different other things and so on in order for them just to make sure that I didn't do any damage. It was long-term, and I didn't. So praise God for you know, good hands and God's favor, and I am fine. I'm still recuperating from sort of being knocked out essentially for 30 days. Uh, you know, getting my strength back, but I'm going to spend it all the day because with the dunking and everything, I'm not holding anything back, okay? All right, so, but the bottom line is, okay, now, I'm just about to say something that if you get your theology wrong on this, it's going to mess you up big time, okay? So I just want to tell you, God has been doing the most extraordinary thing since I got sick, that I, I, as, as magnificent as anything I've seen him do. Now, he didn't have to make me sick to do magnificent things, and he's not the one that made me sick. Does everybody get that? Can we please build our theology on the right foundation? God isn't the one that made me sick, okay? But I do want to make something clear, too. I don't know that I would have ever seen the things. I think he could have done it. He could have done it. I don't think I could have done it. <laughs> to see the things that he was actually doing, nearly as clearly, for sure, but just what he's doing is unbelievable. I mean, I'm, well, you're going to hear it in a second, but I'm as pumped about this church as I've ever been since the day that I got here. Because I have seen him over this last month be the God and Lord and head of this church in a way that is magnificent. And we're going to talk about that today. Now, this is a sermon that's going to connect with baptism, but it's not a baptism sermon, okay? You'll see how deeply it connects. But I want to show you something that is just jaw-dropping. I hope that you get the same sense of it, too. Who's the one that's praying for us today? Chris Maddox. Well, that's awesome. So, Chris, I want you, this Chris Maddox is, is anointed to connect people that have need to people that have a way out of that, to have resources and helps and so on. And so she is actually the longest-serving member of our staff. Because when I first came here, I, I looked at our budget, and we had more money going to benevolence than we did to the church. And I said, who's doing that? And they said, Chris Maddox. And I said, let's hire her. Because that's the church that I want to be. That's the church that we need to be. We need to be a church that is about making a difference in people's lives. And so we did that, and we've been doing it ever since. And Chris, you have rocked it. And there's thousands of people that you have touched and made a huge difference in their life. So this is awesome for you to pray. Pray for the sermon. Pray for the baptism. Lift up another church. So Lord, I just pray today that we as Lake Sam people become rivers of living water here and that you flow through us and today flow through Kurt. And Lord, I just ask for you to um, minister to the people in, down in Mexico through Centerpoint Church today you, as Jesus. they go down building homes for people and giving them shelter. We just lift them up to you and we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here at Lake Sam. Thank you for bringing Kurt back. Thank you for all the people today that are being baptized. I'm so excited about that today. We just lift them up to you, and we you, just Lord. pray for you to empower them with your spirit today. We lift it all up to you in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Not totally sure I'll be able to stay in the chair. I'm, I'm, I need to try and stay in the chair, so help me with that. But uh, all right. You know how in the Bible sometimes God will say, three things I have, yay for, right? So I got three things, yay for. Okay, I want to tell you three ways in which I have seen the Lord move in this last several weeks that have just blown me away. The first one has to do with the congregation, the second one has to do with the staff, and the third one has to do with me. And then there's a fourth that I'm going to add to it, and you're going to see that, and then, you know, it's, it's, this is going to be a fun time. So let's start with the, with the big one, the one that's going to take the longest, the congregation. 
Okay? Now, 2008, churches have lots of money before the fall. They have huge pastoral staffs. The church looked beautiful. Everything was functioning well. Things were going well all over the place. It was an amazing time in church and so on. I'm out on my walk, as those of you who go here regularly know, out on my, out on my walk, and I'm totally surprised by the Lord saying to me, I am desperately unhappy with the American church. I didn't know what that meant. I went back out from my walk day after day until finally he communicated to me in a way that was really clear to me that what he was unhappy about was the discipleship was going through the floor. And I didn't know that, and the numbers weren't saying that. Now, now we know that was actually true. But the point was, is he said, I, I want to do some things, and he started talking to me about what he wanted to do. And I, you know, God's gracious, right? I mean, he, he doled it out in teaspoon-sized parcels for me so that day after day I could start adjusting to a truly, entirely new reality of what he wanted church to be as opposed to what it was. And so day after day I would be praying and then I was bringing it back to the staff and to their great credit, the professional staff that we had here was participating in something that would lead to the end of their employment here. Because what God started showing us was it was the pros were the problem. Churches had so much money that they could go out and hire spectacularly good pastors. They, they, yes, they would raise up teams of people that were helping them, but the truth of the matter was is that all the weight, responsibility, and therefore growth was happening in those people, and the people that were helping were not growing, and they were actually dying, spiritually. It didn't look like that, but that's what was happening. And again, we have the numbers and the statistics and the surveys now to f figure that out for real. But the point was, is that what he said was, is the pros of the problem. I never intended it to be a whole bunch of paid staff, or several paid staff, and then a whole bunch of people that supported them sort of, you know, as they wanted or not wanted or whatever. What he said was, I gave gifts to the body, and I want those gifts to manifest, and I want them to manifest in ways that are difficult and hard, and, and that have politics in them on teams, and that have difficulties here, and, and struggles here, so that they will have to come back to me and find me in the middle of something that means a difference to other people in their lives, because they're the ones that are doing the ministry that are affecting the lives. Do you see it? I mean, that's what he intended. That's what he wanted. And so it took us months, it took us almost a year, frankly, to really figure all this out. And then when we did, we just started making the transition, and we went to something called steering teams, where our worship is done now by people that do not, they're not professionals, they're not paid for it. They're people that have jobs and lives and other responsibilities, and they come together and they function as this beautiful team that is not only getting worship done, it's not getting the task done, that's not the point. The point is finding out what it is that God is calling this body to in terms of worship, finding it together, and then going after it. And you can imagine if you have a bunch of people that are, have very different personalities, that that itself can be a struggle and a challenge, which is all part of discipleship, right? How to prefer one another. How to love one another for real when they've stepped on your toe, or worse. So... This is what we got a hold of, right? Now, when I first started this, you remember I said, honest to goodness, I've been pastoring here long enough and, and I'm not a very good manager and I'm not a very good, anyway, and I, I said, I think we got about a 15% chance of succeeding here. I said that to the congregation. I wasn't making it up. I wasn't being, you know, talking, overstating it. I really felt like there was about an 85% chance that due to my mismanagement and due, frankly, if I may, to... I knew that you know, the first thing I said to the Lord was, I said, people won't do what you're asking them, Lord. They won't work that hard. <laughs> and I expected him to give me a nice little comforting word about how, yes, it'll be okay, Kurt. And instead he was just pregnant in his paws. And he was saying, yeah, that's the problem. This whole thing is not what I want. And I'm going to change it if you'll go with me without any guarantee of success. Now, about a year or two ago, maybe a year and a half ago, we're in this, what, four years now, or maybe somewhere in that ballpark. But anyway, the point is, about four years ago, I, I, or about a couple of years ago, I started saying, you know, the steering teams are going pretty good. We still have a lot more to do, and, and there's a lot further to get them and everything else. But really, already we're getting reports back of the way that people are growing and the things that are happening in the church. And I need to say, I think we're over 50% now. It still doesn't mean we're home, but I felt like, you know what, it's really working, and it's working so much that I could never go back to doing church the other way again. It would feel so superficial 
and wrong. It would feel harmful to people. That's what it would feel like to me to try and go and do church the way we were doing it and the way everybody else was doing it, right? And so I just said, okay, uh, you know what I mean? I'm in, and let's just keep going. Now, here's what happened in these last few days. I don't know where I would have put us, maybe 60% or so. There's still so much to do. Anybody that's involved knows that. But, but I have to tell you, you guys, you blew me away. And not just me. I think, I think what God did was, is, now watch, don't get my theology out of this. But I think that God wanted to remove me from the scene so that he could demonstrate, not just to me, but to everybody here, how much further down the road we actually were. Now, there's two levels on which that happened, and here's the first one. Think about a normal church. What would have happened if a pastor would have been knocked out of commission for a month and a half to two months? What would have happened in a normal church? You know, they would have got by. They would have made it. You know, they, they would have had the associate pastor preach who's preached every once in a while. He preaches every once in a while anyway. I mean, by the way, the pulpit can only be staffed by professionals, right? I mean, only people that have been educated and that are getting paid something for it and so on. And so they would have brought in a guest speaker and they would have brought in some staff and they would have cobbled something together. And you know what I mean? There, something would have happened and it would have been okay, right? And people would have been, as they are, loving and gracious, and they would have felt bad for the pastor, and they would have realized that there was nothing you could do, and so they just would have been gracious and, you know, loving, right? And they would have, they would have, but here's what the attitude would have been. The attitude would have been along the lines of, this is not normal. We're in a rough moment, and we just have to have some patience so that we can get back to normal later. Now, here's what happened at Lake Sam. It, you know, if we're really going to turn ministry over to the people, we've got to turn ministry over to the people. And I said from the very beginning, that includes the pulpit. And that means there's all kinds of people out here that have a word from the Lord that they're supposed to be giving, and we're going to help you and support you, but we're going to prayerfully bring these gifts out of the body so that the body can have the advantage of the gifts that they're not seeing because, after all, you're not professionals. And the pulpit is a sacred place. It does need to be the word of the Lord from the pulpit, right? It needs to be that. It just turns out it's not only the pros who can do that. <laughs> and so what happened for the last two, three years now is we've been raising up. We've had over 30 people from this church preach for their first time ever. And initially when we did this, you know, there was a little bit of, is this going to work? And people were patient and they were gracious, but they were nervous and, then, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But we've been doing it long enough, and frankly, God has blessed it. I think he's blessed it because... We're doing the right thing, and he's saying, I want to favor it. And so consequently, what's happened is, is that it's actually gone pretty well to the point, now listen to me, to the point that when we used to announce that someone was preaching that wasn't me or one of the known pros kind of deal, our attendance would go down significantly. And we weren't going to worry about that. We were just saying, if that's the hit we take, that's the hit that we take, but we're doing the right thing, and we just got to do what we're supposed to do. Do you know now that when we have a guest preacher come, when, I don't mean a guest preacher from outside, I mean when we have somebody from our body speak, do you know that you can't discern any pattern whatsoever in the attendance? Because that's where we are. It's gone well. And people understand that this is who we are. So consequently, all of a sudden, here I get waylaid. I think it, I, I get waylaid. Here's what happened. <laughs> this is the truth. This is awesome, even though it may sound bad. The congregation kind of said, it's okay, you go be sick, we'll take care of it. <laughs> Don't worry. Literally. Now, I prayed. I was the ultimate one that was praying and helping to say who I thought, but I was checking it with people because I'm pretty drugged up and I want to make sure I'm getting it right, you know. And I'm, you know what I mean? And so I'm letting this, and all of a sudden, we have, we had Jerry Cook speak, and Jerry Cook is probably my favorite preacher in, of all preachers I've ever heard in my life. Can I tell you that I think what happened after Jerry Cook preached was better than Jerry Cook? By a large margin? And that's not to say Jerry Cook didn't preach well. It's to say that God took the reins. And he brought in speaker after speaker after speaker. We didn't put together a series what happened was, is that God was speaking to them about a particular topic that Jerry had kick-started, which was, Jerry said, here's how you're supposed to minister. Hear from the Lord and do what he says. 
Well, here's the problem with that. Most people don't hear from the Lord so good, <laughs> or they've got baggage, or they've got issues. Now, let me make it clear. If it, we knew that, and we could have done a series inside of our series, right, about the Holy Spirit. We could have done a series in there about hearing the Lord, right? And we could have done five sermons on hearing the Lord. We could have come up with a series on that, and then I would have preached four of them, and somebody else would have preached one. And can I say that would have been, in my mind, about half of what we actually got? Because here's what God did. When it's just me preaching, and as much as I may be able to get outside of who I am and speak in a way that might relate to somebody else, it's totally different than somebody who is actually something different than what I am and has a different experience than I do and hears the Lord differently. And when all of a sudden, you know, there's four Gospels for a reason. There needs to be four very different perspectives on this one thing in order for us to start to connect in the way that we connect with each one of those and to really get a true picture of what this person of Christ is. And that's what happened here. People from very different perspectives had very different words, had very different ways of approaching it, and they came up and, 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 and spoke God's word to us. And here's how I know that that's true, not just a subjective feeling of it. The reason that I know that's true is because I talk to a lot of people, and I talk to a lot of people all the time. And even while I was sick, whenever I would come out of my haze long enough to be able to be coherent, I would talk to somebody, right? Because I do that, you know? And what happened was, is that I've never had so many people in conversations, in the course of the conversation, without us talking about the sermon, referring back to the material from the sermon. Literally this last week, two people said to me almost the same words. When Adam talked about hearing the voice of the Lord at one time in my life and then I haven't heard anything since, that's me. When Justine talked about the temptation thing, over and over, people were coming up, this is the thing that's happening to me. When, you see what I'm saying? In other words, over and over, people, and I think this was God saying, look, I can do this. <laughs> You want to know how much I got to get to the place to where God can do this and not me? I'm going, to get, I'm going to get a little crass commercial with you. I know you would really prefer that the church be nothing but just, oh, spiritual, wonderful, you know, no, no issues, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, you know, there is like, you know, budgets and money and income and tithing and there's all these concerns and so on. And, you know, you do your best to balance those in a way that's godly, right? And there is a godly balance in there. Let me make that clear. But let me tell you something. The coolest thing that happened in all those speakers, by the way, two of them had never preached before. So here we are in this sort of crisis moment in the church, and we've got two people on our calendar that God has said have them speak. And one of them was Adam Carpenter. And you need to know why Adam Carpenter wasn't supposed to preach that day. He wasn't supposed to preach because that was a first fruit Sunday. And August is the worst month of the year, besides maybe January, depends on how much people spend on summer vacation versus Christmas. But, you know what I mean, money just, you know, it's a problem, right? I'm, I'm crass, I'm being real here, okay? But the point is, is First Fruit Sunday, it, we can track it. If I preach on a First Fruit Sunday, the offering on that most important Sunday when people have money and they can give, the offering is larger by a considerable amount. That's quite helpful to us. So I just, this is a rule of thumb, you know, didn't even really think about it. I just preach on the first Sunday. We ask you not to do retreats and stuff on the first Sunday. We just, we are here, and it helps us to survive, to prosper financially, right? Now, I'm sick. I'm out of it. I think I can be back on that first fruit Sunday. I could have been. I would have caught, it would have paid for it physically, but I could have been here. But what happened in the middle of the month was, is I got this wonderful email from Adam Carpenter, very very respectfully and very humbly saying, I think that God has something to say through me to our congregation that seems to comport with what I'm hearing he's wanting to talk to us about. Now, Adam's never preached before. Adam and I have got some history in love. It's God is healing magnificently. It's a first fruit Sunday. I read the email and I just went, you know, it sounds wonderful and it sounds lovely, but there's no chance he's going to do it. <laughs> but I did actually pray. I told him I'd pray and I actually prayed. If I tell you I'm going to pray, I actually do pray. I, I know that's shocking and surprising, but okay. <laughs> and so I prayed. 
And this idea that he had about there being two different kinds of shepherd, one that would go before people and people would choose to follow him because he was good and he knew them, he knew their name. And another kind of a shepherd that would drive people and he would use dogs to drive the sheep. And what kind of God are you serving? What kind of God is he really in your heart? Is he driving you? Are there dogs that are driving you? Or are you following because he's so good? Now that just started ringing louder and louder in my heart. And I just kept going, man, this is a perfect capper to what we're doing. And finally, because I was seeing how wonderfully it was going with the people that were preaching, and again, we've been doing it for years, so I should have known, but you get the drift. I just went, you know what? I'm out. I don't care what I want. I don't care what makes sense. I care what God wants to do. And God wants to do something beautiful on so many levels more than what we're just talking about right here. And Adam Carpenter just absolutely knocked it out of the park last week. It was beautiful. Yeah, amen, huh? Yeah. That's what the church is supposed to look like. Where did we come up with this one paid guy that was doing all the crap? Tearing all the weight, doing all the responsibility. Where did we come up with that? We came up with it because we're just, it just grooves. It's easier for us, right? It's just not what God wants at all. He wants the body bringing their gifts, and he wants the body to be the kind of body that will allow somebody to bring their gifts. And as much as it was beautiful what these preachers have been doing throughout this time and bringing the word of the Lord to us, I'll tell you something that's more beautiful in my heart. It's you guys. Here's why. In a normal church, what they'd be saying is, we have to endure and have patience and grace and mercy for this difficult time until we can get back to normal. And what this congregation did, and I'm not saying everybody did this perfectly, but I'm telling you, I've talked to enough people, and I saw what was happening, and I saw the fruit of what God was doing that I can say this confidently. What most people in this body did, particularly ones that are part of us for a long time and have seen the progression and what God's trying to do with us, what most people did in this church was is that they said, now again, I want to be very loving about this so that you understand. But the notes I was getting were, we miss you, we love you, we want you to come back, and everything else. But nobody said that I had to come back. <laughs> right? In fact, what people were saying was, take as long as you need. <laughs> now, that was not a negative. What that was was a body that is maturing in a thing that God is trying to do to where we're recognizing that we're the church. And it's not dependent on any one person. You take a pastor out of, the, out of the lineup, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It's nice when he comes back. It's okay when he doesn't. The fact of the matter is God is the head of the church, and God is the one who's bringing his gifts, and God is the one who's bringing his word, and God is the one who's bringing his revelation, and God is the one who's doing the ministry that he wants to do. Amen? Amen? Now that's what happened here. And that's what I was sitting there, again, in a half haze going, I didn't have any idea how far down the road we actually were. I didn't have any idea how much transition God had actually been doing in every person's heart in this body to where we were becoming the church that he wants us to be. Now, that's cool. That's awesome. <laughs> that's number one. Number two. The staff. Before I left, I've been saying this for a while. I've been saying, I'm just at an age, and I'm in a place, and God's doing something. He's clearly been telling me this. And understand this. As a young man, lots of testosterone, lots of delusions of grandeur and other things, and, and, and illusions of my capabilities and so on, I actually really liked running the organization called Lake Sam. I don't mean pastoring, that's a different thing. I mean being the CEO, essentially, of an organization. I liked it, I found fulfillment in it, I found things in it. Now it turns out I'm bad at it, <laughs> which I learned over the last few years. 
And I appreciate the amen. I don't know where it came from, but I'm sure it was a well-earned amen. Okay? So the point is, is that what's been happening lately to me is, is that there's been this, if I can put it this way, a distaste for all things managerial and CEO-ish. And there has been a flavor for pastoring, for raising up people. Can I make this clear? I'm going to still preach every once in a while, and more than every once in a while. I'm going to still preach. But can I tell you, I'm getting more joy out of seeing Adam Carpenter knock it out of the park than I am getting up here and speaking. And this is probably the thing I like doing more than anything else in the world, right here, right now. And God is transitioning me so much that I get more joy. I see more of God when I get to work with somebody and I get to do and the way that Justine's coming on and, and Jesse's first sermon ever, which was spectacular. So cool. In fact, I think it was a, it was a model for how God wants to bring preaching to because I think the days of the talking head, I hope to God, are numbered. And I hope to God what he's going to start doing is teaching us like he did when he walked with us as opposed to having somebody preach and everybody's supposed to go do it later. I don't know what the heck, but I don't care. But are you getting it? So, so what I did was is I, I got this taste in my heart for raising up other people and being able to do some preaching, but being able to pastor and actually get to be with people like I used to get to do. I used to go to, I used to, go to breakfast once a week with John Yalkowski. We did that for, what, maybe two years? Maybe even three years? You know, uh, and all the things I look back at the church, that's, that's one of my best memories in the whole church. I haven't been able, I haven't had the time or the energy or the, the enough gas left to do something like that for years. And I'm just at a place where I'm saying, that is wrong. And I'm not going to do it. So what I did is I came to what we now call the strategic team. It's Jesse, JJ, Amy, and Wanda. And it's four people who understand the church and so on. And what I did to them before I left on the trip, before I got sick, before anything happened, I went to them and I said this. I said, I want you guys to figure out all the responsibilities that I have that are more in this CEO managerial level. And I want you to take all those responsibilities and just divvy them up amongst yourself because I don't want to do them anymore. Now, in my head, I'm thinking this is going to take about two years. But what I'm thinking, I, I want to start it while I'm gone. God is so much better than me. If, if, he if they would have done what I said, I don't know that we'd be a church a year from now. Because here's what we've done. Now watch this. God has brought in, and this is by plan, right? We said, I think we're getting too narrow in personality type. So I went to Scott Chin and I said, find me people that are not like me. Because I keep finding people that are like me, and that's how I like them. I want you to find me people, I'm not saying I don't like them, so don't take that, but I said, find me people that are not like me because this church needs to be broader because the church of God looks bigger than what we do. I don't mean bigger in number, I mean broader in depth and breadth of personality types. And so I said, find us people like that, and sure enough, we've done that. And we now have four people on that strategic team that really come at life from completely different places. And frankly, I think it's safe to say that maybe with some, some, they wouldn't even necessarily, like if they were in high school, they wouldn't be in the same clique. They love God, but they're just very different people. And if they'd have taken what I said, what they would have done is they would have taken different parts of the church and they would have run with the church in the ways that they think the church should be. And they would have, it would have been the guy that was tied to four horses and then split apart. So God's big, and he knows what he's doing. So these people get together, and thankfully what they do is they start talking, and they say this. We got a problem. We're not on the same page. See, right now they're on the same page as long as I'm involved because I'm sort of, you know, I, I can make the final call, and if I think it should be a certain way, then people will go ahead and defer to it. And as long as I'm there, everybody's on the same page. Do you get the drift? You know what that means? They're not really on the same page. Right? because they're not personally on the same page. They're just doing what's right in an organizational structure. Here's what I want to say about organizational structures. <laughs> Here's what I want to say God actually wants to do, make people one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To where their hearts, their minds, their vision, 
the preference of one another, love for one another, grace towards one another, the fullness of God towards one another is so great that that team is one. In vision, in execution, they understand their strengths and they understand their weaknesses, and they rely on other people's strengths in order that the team genuinely be a team that is all focused on pulling yours in the same way to get that thing down the thing as quickly, as best, as efficiently as possible, and bottom line, that they're all heading to the same goal so that we get to where God wants us to be. And what we found was is we did not have that kind of harmony in that team. Now, if you know me, you know what I do is, is I fix things. That's probably the, you know what I mean? If I walk into a situation and there's something broken about it, I just am drawn to what's broken about it, and I try and fix it. I don't always succeed, but I sure do try. And God had me waylaid to the point that I was actually able to pay attention to him when he said to me, don't you dare go back in there and try and fix that. This is hands off. Now, we're not done with this. I don't even know how it's going to end. I don't know if it's going to end well. What I can tell you is, is God has told me, hands off. You can say some things, you can cast some vision, and that's it. Because they have to work it out amongst themselves. Because until they do, they're never going to be one. Right? If you can take one out of the situation and they're no longer one, that's not oneness. And so this one right here, I need you guys to be praying about. Because I think that there's a miracle that could happen if you could get four totally disparate personalities to all start to love one another and fear the Lord in such commonality that they're all pulling on the oars in the right way and moving towards something. And the breadth, because of the different personalities, the, the breadth of what we could do would just be un unbelievable. I have this vision of what God could do, and I'm asking you, pray for it because we're not there. We have a distance to go. But that's number two, and that's one of the things that I saw. And you see how much that comports with number three, which is what he's doing in me, which is what he is saying is, stop running the church. Start raising up people. Minister. Trust me. I've got the rest. I'll take care of it. I'll do what I got to do. And I'll make it better than you could have ever done it. And I got to tell you, I feel like I'm in springtime. I thought it was a two and a half year process I was looking at. A two to two and a half years. That's what I had in my head as a calendar. You know what I think now? It's now. <laughs> we're a lot further down the road than I knew that we were. The fact of the matter is, the things that I'm doing right now are really profitable, and I'm about to show you just how profitable. But I just want to say right now, the things that I'm wanting to do and the things that I'm doing, God is anointing, and they are making a huge difference. And the fact of the matter is, if I went back over to that other thing, it would just be death for all, for what he was trying to do and for me and for everybody else. And so I just want to say something. Again, God did not make me sick. But do you realize this is the longest period of time that I've been away from this church since I got here 15 years ago? I've never been gone more than three Sundays in a row. And I've been gone since June. <laughs> Don't get this wrong. It's awesome. I love this place. But I think he's keeping me away long enough that I can come back and do what he's telling me to do and not have to fit into some mold, right? This is who God is. He can do things quick. Usually I'm the one pushing him. This is him saying, no time like the present, go for it. So we're going to go for it. And are we going to have some problems? Yes. If we love each other, if we care about each other, if we pray for each other, if we prefer each other, are we going to get through it? if we keep him first. So that's the three things, the congregation, the staff, and me. And I said there was three, yay, four. I want to take all of those things and I want to show you something that I, I personally, again, find mind-blowing. There are a number of people in this congregation who do not actually know the Lord yet. And I say they're in the congregation. Why? Because they come to church here all the time. And I want to say something. We're not the kind of church that sort of does things so superficially that it's easy for a person from the world to be here because, after all, it's not at all 
different than the world, so it's easy to be here if you're still in the world, right? We're actually a church that takes things very seriously and goes very deep with them, and we're going after God in a very real way, and I take it as a point of pride, not that they haven't come to the Lord yet, because I'm praying that they do come, Lord, but I take it as a point of pride that smart people who are seeking the Lord can come here and can find a family, can find people that love them, can find a way of discussing things that are important to them in real and deep ways. And so we have a number of people in here that are going through this process. I'm, I, we've had them all along. Long. I'm looking at one right now, Dave McCoy. How long did it take you to come to the Lord? Oh, uh, 45, years. 45 years. And how long were you at Lake Sam, though? It was like a year and a half, two years before you actually did this. And, and, and this, is, this was it. And Dave would send me these emails, and we would talk about stuff, and we would converse and do all this kind of stuff. Well, Dave McCoy, the sequel is happening. There's several sequels that have happened. But I want to show you something here. This is a person that doesn't know the Lord. I, have I made that clear? Because I want to show you what people at this place that don't even know the Lord know about the Lord. Because this is incredible. Now, I, I hope I got this right, and I hope I can run it. This is all part of our Empowered series, where what we're doing is we're talking about how when you let the Holy Spirit actually be the Holy Spirit, <laughs> when you actually let him lead, when you be the one that's following that good shepherd, that he will lead you into the most extraordinary places. And so this guy and I have been talking and we've been conversing and going back and forth, and this is a long conversation, and I'm letting you in at something that happened probably two, three weeks ago, and I knew instantly that this was for the Baptism Sunday. As soon as I read it, that, that God was giving me my baptism sermon from a person that doesn't know the Lord. Think about that, okay? There's some really, really good theology in there somewhere. Okay. Now, he had said something about the way that God is and the way that he needs him to be, and I kind of said, I hear what you're saying, and here's my explanation for it, but here's what I want to say back. Why is this so important to you? Because I'm not really tracking with that. Why is this so important to you? I wasn't catching it. Here's what he said to me. I need Jesus to be truly challenged in his temptations so that I can be assured of his empathy. This comes out of the sermon with Justine. And what he was saying was, is he was saying, if, God, if Jesus was God and he wasn't really tempted, then how does he really know what I'm going through? How can I really think that he's empathetic if he really, you know, I mean, he's God. I mean, whatever Satan would have tempted him with, he would have overcome it like nothing, right? He said, I need to find more deeply where he was tempted. That's pretty good, isn't it? I'm struggling with taming my words here. Now listen to this. Because this is, this is the world, and this is good. I have such an overwhelmingly negative reaction at the idea of judgment being cast by someone of privilege who has never experienced the plight of the condemned. This just happens, the, this happens so often the world over with race and gender and class an oppressive situation of somebody that says they're for you, but really they don't know anything about it. <laughs> right? I need to know to my core that Jesus has delved so deeply and lovingly into, paraphrasing, what it is to be immortal regarding temptation and suffering that I can't help but allow myself to be vulnerable with him. You see it? I can't, I can't be vulnerable with him unless I know that he understands what it is I'm really struggling with. Do you know that he just hit the very most fundamental theme in the whole of Scripture and the whole of God's creation having to do with us? Do you know that? Here's what I mean by that. God made us, but he gave us free will. And what he told us was is that he would not overcome that free will. And here's what that means. If nobody ever does it the way that God made possible, if nobody ever gets it right, then God himself is not allowed to judge. That may sound funny to you, but listen to this again and then go research it and you'll find out it's true. In fact, here's where it really plays out. John, the disciple, before he dies, is lifted up to heaven and he sees the final scene. And what he sees is, is that the world has gone to hell in a handbasket. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And finally God says, enough. I am now going to do something where 
I am going to completely overcome the temptation and the things that are against me so that I can allow people to go into the things that are for, the things that are with, the things that are me, the things that I created and intended from the beginning, but we fell and fell away from. Now John, what he's, what he's got is the angel has this scroll in his hand, and then there's seven seals around the scroll. And the scroll is when you open it up, that's the judgments on the world that overcome the temptation so that we can go into the fullness that God intended. <clears throat> and the angel asks, who's worthy to break these seals? Do you know what he's asking? This question right here. Who has struggled with this to the very depths of it and kept God first? Chose God over everything else that was there. Who's done that? And John begins to weep because there's nobody found to open those seals. And that means that forevermore we are going to be under temptation. We're going to be under this fallen nature. Oh my God, what a horror. And then all of a sudden the Lamb of God comes out. Jesus Christ. The one who has suffered to the depths of it. He's the one that's worthy. He breaks the seals. And God is able to transition creation to what he intended it to be. You see that? That's the whole story of redemption and salvation. And he's asking the question. Now what he does is, is that he says, does Jesus fulfill these requirements? Now, he answers the question himself. He has several different logical points, okay? It, it reminded me so much of some emails from you, Dave. So just brilliant. But listen to this. He gets down to the last one, and he says, I think the additional fact that makes Jesus the fulfillment of the requirement stated above, and then I never heard phrased this way, and it's true. I've never heard this revelation before, is this. While he was dealing with the temptation for 40 days straight, he was concurrently dealing with the foreknowledge of the impending moment that he would ultimately have to face in his separation of God on the cross. I'll parse this for, in a sec. Yes, I do hear how bad that moment, that separation from God on the cross, but first, I don't think I hear enough how bad it was what Jesus went through. Now, when he said that, it resonated with me as a preacher because here's what I feel. I feel that we really don't understand how deeply Jesus suffered. That we really don't understand the depths of what was taking place there. You do remember that Jesus goes into the garden and being in agony, this is right before he's being arrested and then the crucifixion will happen. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down the ground. Has anybody ever prayed or done anything so earnestly that your sweat became like drops of blood? Have you ever, have you ever been in that much consternation about something? Have you? In fact, what he says too is, is he says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup. <laughs> If there's any other way to get out of this thing, this is so bad, get me out. You love me, I love you. If there's some other way, let's take it. Right? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Now, when we see those words, here's what I think we're referring to. I think we're referring to the pain, the suffering. I think that what we think when we read these words, what Jesus didn't want to have happen was that he would be beaten, that he'd be scourged, you know, with the cat of nine tails where there was metal at the end of the leather strips and they would whip and then they'd pull the flesh and then they would crush the crown on him and then they would beat him and then they would hang him on a tree in the most gruesome way that's ever been invented to kill somebody because the Romans were good at getting people to subject themselves to the Romans by being fearful that the Romans were so good at killing people in horrible ways. So we think that when Jesus was sweating, oh God, let this cup pass from me, I think we just naturally tend to think something like this. It's because he's so freaked out about this incredible pain that he's going to go through. Now Jesus was fully human, and I want to say, I think he was pretty freaked out. <laughs> but I can tell you that's not why he was in consternation, praying so hard that it became his drops of blood. The reason why he was praying for that David prophesied it a thousand years before Jesus experienced it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, Jesus would become 
our sin, all the decisions, all the choices that we made to go some other way than God, would all those consequences, all those choices would come back onto, God, onto Christ on that cross. And at that moment in time, he who had been eternally one with God is no longer holy because he has become our sin. And he can no longer be part of the Trinity. Now be careful here, because Jesus is part of the Trinity, right? Still. But in a moment, there's some sort of a separation of a state of being that Jesus has been for his whole world. And here's what's funny to me about this, and this is so important. We think about the pain and all that kind of stuff. When we think about being separated from somebody, that's bad, but that's not like as bad as getting beaten and doing this cross thing, right? Unless you're somebody who's actually lost somebody who you thought was more important to you than life itself. If you're one of those very unfortunate few people here who has lost somebody in some tragic way in an untimely manner, and they were more important to you than life yourself, you know what it feels like to have a part of you, half of you just ripped apart from you right? And what he's trying to say is, take the oneness that you felt at that moment, multiply it by, an inf by infinity, and this is what the eternal Godhead has in oneness with Christ. And Jesus is going to experience a tearing away. And that tearing away and that separation, all of the physical pain that we see in this act is God saying this. He's allowing us because we do not connect with being separated from a person and we do connect with pain. We don't want that. That seems horrible what happened to him. This seems brutal and terrible. And God is trying to use that metaphor. He's trying to use that moment to communicate to us something terrible is happening. And you don't get how terrible it really is, but I'm trying to give you some way to access it because of the way that he's beaten. See it? Now watch. This person's email again. And second, I think his desert temptation and really the rest of his life only makes deep sense if you constantly remember that everything he did was in the shadow of his certainty, the certain knowledge that he had that the worst thing possible was in his cards. I just don't think it's useful to discuss these things separately, his life and the thing that he faced in his life. Here's what that means. You stand up here for just one sec, Jesse. No, don't worry about it. This is, this is what this is, okay? What I'm doing is, is I'm saying, I'm going to give you absolutely everything. Okay? I'm going to give you everything. Everything. That's what Satan promised Jesus in the temptations. I'm going to give you everything. I do ask that you worship me. And Justine says it's only once. I haven't checked that out. I'm sure it's true because she's good at her scripture. But, but, but even if just one time, that's the only cost of it. Now, that right there would be a pretty hard decision, right? You know what I mean? Do I do it God's way or do I do it the other way and everything else? Now, watch what, watch what this guy's saying. How much harder would that decision be if you knew that by getting everything that you, everything, right? And you just have to do this one little thing. And if you refuse to take that deal, then the thing that was going to happen to you was guaranteed to be horrible. Now how hard does it come to how hard does it become to make this decision? Do you see it? By him not taking the easy deal, it doesn't mean, oh, everything is lollipops and roses and it's all gonna be groovy. What it means is quite the contrary of it. It means that there's no other way for this cup to pass. Then, but for Jesus to go through the worst thing that he could ever possibly go through, being separated, even if but for a moment. Thanks, Jess. You see it? Now, here's what this guy's saying. Now I think he suffered. <laughs> you see what he did? This is a revelation I'd never heard before. He connected the very end with Christ's ministry to its very beginning moment. 
And then he said, everything that he did was done in the light. That no matter how many people he healed, no matter how much good he did, no matter how much he reached out, no matter what a blessing that he was, that in the end what was going to happen to him was the worst possible thing. And now this guy says, that sounds like a Jesus that knows suffering. That sounds like a Jesus I can be vulnerable to. That sounds like a Jesus that understands what I'm going through. The way that we say it scripturally is, we don't have a priest who's out of touch with our reality. He's been through weaknesses and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he's so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. See, here's what Jesus could have done. I passed, you all flunked, off to hell with you. Here's what he did instead. I wanted to show you what a big deal this was to be able to pass. I want to show you how big a deal it was, how deep it was, how much suffering is involved, how much everything is involved, because here's what I want to do. If you will receive the suffering that I took upon myself for you, if you will allow that to happen, that you receive what I did for you, then I can make you new. I can give you a new heart. I can give you a new nature. I can orient you a new way. And instead of being oriented towards the temptation and wanting to do it and knowing that it's probably wrong but not, get, not having the strength to overcome it, I can give you a new nature. And even when you fall, I am still the one who is taking upon myself the fall that you have done. And what I'm doing is, is I'm bringing this new reality to pass even now in your life. Now, there's two levels on this, and I'm done. The first level is, I think that's, I don't know, I don't know, does anybody else, did anybody else understand the gospel more deeply than that when you walked in here today as Christians for 30, 40, 50 years? Did anybody understand the gospel more deeply than that? Because I don't know how to understand it more deeply than what he just put it, because I don't think I understood it as deeply as he just articulated it to me. And what this is telling me is, is that if we will truly be a body that is allowing the gifts of the body to come forth, that God has the most astounding revelations for us. And he will completely transform every single one of our lives through it. And so I get super excited. But the second thing, and this is the one that connects it to baptism. The second thing is, is that when we get baptized, this is the God that we're being baptized into. Think about something for a second. What was he struggling over? Was it fear of pain? No. It was fear of being disconnected. It was fear of not being one. His final prayer, the whole purpose of his ministry is summed up right here. I'm praying not only for them, the, the actual disciples that are sitting right there, but also for those who will believe in me because of them. That's us. We believe in Jesus because of the testimony of the disciples. And because of them and their witness about me, the goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So they all may be one heart and mind with us that the world might believe that you in fact sent me because this kind of oneness is impossible, absent God being the one who's providing the energy to get past what divides us into the deeper place of what unites us. The vision is always trying to fragment us. And God is supplying what it takes to unite us into genuine oneness. And so he says, the same glory you gave me, I gave them so that they may be united, one, unified and together as we are. I in them, you in me, me in them, them in me, you know, all of us, that we may all mature into real, full, and rich oneness. What are we doing at a baptism? We're being baptized into an incredible community. If you went to the class last week, you learned this. You're being baptized into a family that is going to help you and support you and stand by you and do all this kind of stuff. That is incredible, right? But let's just make it clear. The depths and the reason for this family being as wonderful as it is is because we're being connected to a God who has suffered everything because he loves you. And he just wants to be one with you. And he's not the shepherd that's going to drive you. 
He's the shepherd who's going to offer it to you. If you want, come. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go watch some people get baptized, and we're going to celebrate it as a community. If you have to go, I love you, go ahead and go. But I hope that you stay because what we're doing right now, literally right now, is we're headed out to the front parking lot and we're going to celebrate as a family people making a choice to be one with God and one another. That the world may know. Okay? So that's where we're headed. Like I say, head that direction. I've got to change into some swimming trunks. Uh, I'll be out there in two